And Nick, why don't you open us in prayer? Okay. Dear Lord, uh, thank you just for another night uh, in your word. Uh, thank you for the uh, ability to be able to meet uh, together, Lord, whether it be over Zoom or in person. Father, I just thank you for the technology, but also thank you just for your word, Lord, and um, what you have uh, to teach us in Revelation. Father, I pray for uh, wisdom that is given to Mike. Um, uh, I just thank you just that uh, we are blessed with the teaching, uh, Lord, and when it comes to your word, Father. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that, Lord, and I know everyone else here as well is thankful for that as well, Lord. Uh, so, Lord, I lift up this, uh, this Bible study uh, uh, to you, Father. Um, I, I pray that it will be pleasing to you, Lord. Um, and I just thank you just for your son dying on the cross, Lord, that we may be able to have a relationship with you, Father. Um, in your precious name, amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, so we did not finish Sardis last week. So I think we're ready for like verse four, but let me just read the, the message to Sardis again anyway, just for the context. So uh, it is the first six verses of chapter three. John writes, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know uh, at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. So um, that's the message to Sardis. We're ready for on page 14 uh, for that question on um, verse four. Let me just rem remind you that what we talked about last week is uh, Sardis is in a deep spiritual coma. I think with the, we're talking to a church that, that uh, is comprised of a lot of unsaved people. And the, the spiritual lead, the, the leadership in that church, the church leadership, uh, obviously is very lax in their teaching. They have gone away from the gospel, which explains why the church is full of a bunch of unsaved people. And, um, and so We'll just take it from there. Um, I will say that I, I forget if, if it was last week or a week before last, I think it was last week, when somebody brought up the issue of the wheat and tares. Do you remember that? And uh, that if it applies here. And uh, remember, I, I, if you remember, I answered that by saying the important thing to remember about Jesus's parable about the wheat and tares is it was a parable about the world. The field was the world, not the church. Remember, he told his angels, I mean, he told um, um, his, his uh, servants just to let the tares grow up with the wheat in the field and at the end of the age, the angels will harvest uh, and and separate out the wheat from the, the wheat from the tares, and the tares will be 
burned up. That is not, that does not apply to the church. That we do not use that principle in the church. Remember, we use the principle that Jesus laid down in Matthew 18. When your brother sins against you, you go to him. And, and, and it starts out just one-on-one -on -one and the circle widens as uh, the person refuses to repent. Um, and remember, I think it was in 1 Corinthians 5, I think it was, uh, where Paul told the church, remove the sinner from your midst. And that's exactly what we see happening. What, well, when we went through First and Second Peter, we saw how um, uh, Peter confronted the false teachers and, and how the false teachers are supposed to be purged from the from the church and it's the same thing that we've been seeing in jesus's uh royal edicts to his churches so in the church we don't let the wheat the tares grow with the wheat uh the sinner is confronted in the world the devil uh, tries to confuse matters by sowing uh, bad seed along with the wheat. And we, in the world, the tares will grow up with the wheat and, and uh, that will be resolved at the end of the age. Okay? So I, I just wanted to <clears throat> clarify that. Which, so that which chapter is that in my son, Matthew? Yes, it's Matthew. Is it 13? The wheat and tares? Matthew 13 is, is his parables yeah, in Matthew. 13, 24, 30. Yeah. So when you read that parable, you want to make a distinction between what he is talking about there in Matthew 13 and how we, how we handle sin and that sort of thing in the church. And the key there in that parable is, is the field is the world, not the church. Okay. Make sense. Okay. Cause I can see how that can be confusing when we go through all of this stuff that we're going through in Revelation 2 and 3, in 1st and 2nd Peter and Jude, uh, um, uh, 1st Corinthians 5, 1st, I mean, 2nd Thess 2, I mean, there's a lot, uh, Titus 1, there's a lot of passages that, uh, and, and Titus also chapter 3, I believe. There's a, there's a lot of passages that, that deal with how to handle sin in the church and I can see how it'd be confusing then when you read through that parable of the wheat and tares of Matthew 13 and think now nah, he's just saying to let them grow up together how does this work so that's the distinction whenever you read through that parable note in particular that the field is the world not the church okay Mike, in terms of like practical differences, like I, I've always thought, I always thought like you said that, um, like you said that most people say that the parable of the tears is about the church. And maybe I've never actually heard someone teach on that. I just assume that or something or hearsay or whatever. But um, that kind of leads to a sense of in the church, there is like, there's talk about the visible church versus the invisible church. And it makes it feel like there's a, and maybe this, maybe this could be the case still, but like there's a, if you view it that way, that there's just like an invisible, um, invisible amount of unbelievers in the church, which is still the case. So maybe that's not affected, but. Right. Uh, if I understand what you're saying, um, uh, churches, can and many times are still a mixed company yeah because you'll have unbelievers coming into the church however um 
we uh, we deal with sin with believers. Remember, so so in a church, if you have a mixed company in a church and a person is an unbeliever, we wouldn't exercise church discipline with them, we would explain to them the reason you're having a hard time, not the reason you're having a hard time, uh, not, uh, living in sin. Yeah. Living in sin. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> These double negatives are always hard. Uh, not living in sin is because you're, you're not, you need the savior. Yeah. You need regeneration. So, uh, for instance, is it, um, um, in first John, um, I forget the exact passage I'm referring to. What I tell people is we cannot read a person's heart, but when we see a person, you know, a so-called brother or sister that are sinning, we can, we can approach them and say, that's not the way a believer lives. And you know, and talk to them about that sin. And, uh, and, um, and eventually we can challenge them to check uh, themselves to see if they're really in the faith. Uh, but if they insist they're believers in all of that, uh, and they want to cling to their sin, then we just continue going through the Matthew 18 process. But if somebody's in the church that we know is an unbeliever and they don't claim to be a believer, um, because you know we've had that situation certainly, um, then we wouldn't use the Matthew 18 process on them. We would evangelize them, gospelize them. Uh, so does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And. Um, the invisible church, the only part of it that's invisible are the ones that's gone on to be with the Lord. The rest of it were alive. Well, I mean, you, uh, I guess in a sense, all the believers throughout the world are invisible to us because we don't see them, but they are visible to, to some, <laughs> to those that they rub shoulders with and all of that. And so uh, the invisible church, I think, usually is used with reference to the whole body of Christ. So the local church is just a local physical manifestation of the body of Christ. It's not the whole body of Christ, obviously. It's a local uh, uh, visible manifestation of the body of Christ and in in that local church we we take sin seriously and 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 uh, help each other in our fight against sin uh, to put sin to death and uh, we've seen in these letters uh, why that's necessary because sin is always there it's an enemy that's always seeking to destroy us. And like Owen said, uh, if you are not uh, killing sin, sin will be killing you. And, and that is precisely what we see in these, these seven letters, these seven royal edicts. Okay, uh, so now we're uh, Sardis. Uh, there's a bunch of, uh, we see that it's, um, uh, must be largely comprised of unbelievers. However, we see in verse four why there's still hope for Sardis. Uh, Jesus says, yet you still, uh, you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Um, and so the question here on page 14, in verse 4, Christ explains why, why the church is not completely dead. Explain the contrast of soiled garments 
and white garments. Well, white garments would represent clean, right? Or pure. Yes. Yes. And soiled is soiled is like a I think of soiled, I think of like a diaper <laughs> or something like I don't know. So Oh, you always go to the extremes there. Yeah. Mean. I yeah. I I yeah. <laughs> but that's true. So the soil garment in uh in this case. And I think in uh, most of the places that we see it in, in the book of Revelation, soiled garments is a reference to unsaved people, okay? So clean garments would be a reference to someone who's been regenerated uh, and forgiven. And he says, you have a few names that Name stands for people. You you have a few people who have not soiled their garments, who, in other words, have clean garments, who are who are saved, who are regenerated, who have life and are walking with Christ. And he says, they, those that have the uh that have not soiled their garments, they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So they're, they're clean or pure garments symbolize their faithfulness. And according to this verse, it foreshadows uh, the white victory garments that they're going to receive. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to see that, I think, in chapter 7. I think in chapter 7 or 11 or both. But definitely, I think definitely seven, and also in chapter nineteen, uh, the marriage feast of the Lamb, the bride, they wear white garments, and the implication here. Uh, um, well, let me just go to this next question because the implication I was going to raise uh, is addressed by this next question: In what way are the ones in white garments, worthy to walk with Christ. Notice he says that. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. In what way are they worthy <clears throat> to walk with Christ? I, always, I hope that those kind of statements always perk up your ears and and uh, catch your attention. Is that because they've been washed in the blood? Yes, exactly, Carol. Exactly. Through salvation, they have made, been made fit for fellowship with Christ. Okay? And the reward is white garments, white victory garments. And so... They're worthy because of what Christ has done on their behalf. All right. So then um, um, in verse five, what three things are promised to the conqueror or the overcomer? Clothed in white garments. Yes. Name never blotted out of the book of life. Yes. And their name confessed before the Father and, and the holy angels. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I I don't know why I'm guessing at these other passages about the white garments. I got it written down here in my notes. Uh, chapter 7, 13, and verses 13 and 14, and chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Uh, they also um, uh, uh, show believers getting, you know, receiving the white garments, being clothed in white uh, garments. And those are victory garments. The white garments are victory garments. Uh, so they are the, so these overcomers, these conquerors, the overcomers are going to receive victory garments 
and have fellowship, intimate fellowship with Christ. It's what we saw in verse four. They're going to walk with him. Um, uh, name secure in the book of life. Uh, before I address that, because the next question addresses that, okay? Let me, uh, uh, the, the third thing that uh, Ian mentioned is he will confess their names before the Father and holy angels. I'm watch, I, I love this passage in Zephaniah. Uh, Zephaniah 3, verse, verses 14 through 17. Zephaniah is one of the last minor prophets. So um, Zephaniah 3, I think it's the fourth to last prophets. There's... There's only three minor prophets after Zephaniah. Um, okay, Zephaniah 3, verses 14 through 17. Listen to this. This is um, after Israel has been restored. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. Now get this. Um, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. God's going to sing to his people. Um, uh, I always think of this passage when, with this promise here in uh, that he will, con those who um, um, overcome, conquer, he will confess mm -hmm. their names before the Father and the holy angels. As a matter of fact, he'll sing over us. Uh, that's, that's an amazing promise. That's how joyful God is. Uh, about it. Do you remember when he when he sent uh, the seventy out during his when Christ sent the seventy out during his earthly ministry, and they came back and they were so excited. Uh, even the even the spirits, uh, even demons, uh, uh, obeyed them. Uh, they were and they were so excited and and Jesus made some initial comments to them and then in the text you can see this both in the Luke text and in the Matthew um, uh, 11 text uh, Jesus turns and internally he he prays to the father and it says he rejoiced greatly that uh, they, were able to see those things, experience those uh, things. And in, in the Luke passage, it translates it, he exalted mightily or exceedingly. And the picture there is internally, you could see him just jumping up and clicking his heels together. Uh, he was so happy they got to experience those things. And so, uh, that's the kind of joy that God has over his people. So when he says he's going to confess our names before the fathers and the angels, he's not going to, in a monotone, uh, open up the book of life and just read off the list. You know, he, he um, uh, is 
rejoicing greatly over us and confessing this before the father and his angels so this is a this is a precious promise this is a precious picture of god's joy over us now i turn off the sound of these text notifications will jan still hear the phone call yeah yeah okay, okay. uh Good. our expert says yes <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what in the world is the book of life? He says that your names, uh, that he will never blot out his name, never blot his name out of the book of life. What is the book of life? I've got two questions here. First of all, just an understanding of what the book of life is. The book of of life, if you look up those verses I've got written down, they're the, uh, well, they refer to the book of life, uh, but the book of life is God's registry of life. That is his registry of all those elected unto salvation. That's what the book of life is, is God's registry of life. So believer, you're in God's registry of life. But now here's a question. I I uh, want you to consider, look at chapter 20 in Revelation, chapter 20, verse 12. It's, it's the great white throne judgment. And in verse 12, John writes, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. So those are the books of deeds, okay? Verse, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, and so then, uh, down, drop down in verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. Let's see. Is there another reference to the? Yeah. So my question is, my question is, how can the inclusion of our names in the book of life compensate for our deeds listed in the book of deeds. So that's the picture of the great white throne judgment. Books were opened, then another book. The dead were judged out of the books of deeds. And whoever's name was not found in the book of life, they were cast in the lake of fire. How can your the inclusion of your name in God's registry of life compensate for uh, our deeds listed in the book of deeds. This is not a trick question. It's got a simple gospel answer to it, but I just wanted to, I just wanted to point this out and bring you to see this. Karen. I say by grace, by, by Jesus Christ and not of works. Exactly. Exactly. It's not a matter of he drew up one list and another list. It's the only reason that we are not there with the dead being judged out of the book of the books of deeds is because, as Karen said, he has saved us. And the book of life is a registry of all those whom before time he set his affection on. And then in time, uh, he sent his son to die for us, and he sent his spirit to chase us down and uh, regenerate us, save us, sanctify us. Uh, our deeds are all paid for. Our deeds are all paid for. Very good, Pam. Excellent. So I just wanted to bring that to your table. We just wanted you to think through that, okay? All righty. So that's Sardis. 
a church full of unsaved people, uh, a leadership that's not teaching, preaching the gospel. They've got a few people that are still saved and walking with Christ, and that's their hope. And they, he told them, remember what you received, which was the gospel of grace. Uh, uh, you are to repent and uh, uh, hold on to it. And the holding on to it is the preaching of it and the teaching of it and, and, and all of that. So um, that's Sardis. Okay, now the next church is Philadelphia. Um, let me read that passage. Verses uh, 7 through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word with a uh, word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on it, on, on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, now in the notes, um, I've got written there about Philadelphia, the city. Philadelphia lay on the main Roman postal route from Pergamum through Sardis to the east. It was strategically located for commerce and was called the gateway to the east. Despite its prosperity, it had a fault line under it. And... Uh, in AD 17, that's during the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, who was the emperor when Christ was born, Sardis and Philadelphia suffered widespread damage from an earthquake. And although Sardis was closer to the epicenter of the earthquake, Philadelphia experienced destructive aftershocks for years afterwards. So Rome gave generous disaster relief to Philadelphia. And so in gratitude, the uh, city leaders erected this huge monument to Tiberius and renamed the city Neo Caesarea, meaning Caesar's new city. And whereas we don't find as much evidence of a sizable Jewish population, that is archeological evidence. Nonetheless, the problems that are addressed in this letter indicate that there was a sizable Jewish uh, population that was hostile toward Christians. There's just not much remains of it left uh, in the modern day uh, location of uh, Philadelphia. All right. 
So you can see, you can see how what happened to them during the life of Christ, the early life of Christ, when they, uh, well, no, it's about, Christ would have been about 21 years old when this earthquake struck. Uh, you can see um, how uh, this set them up for catering to the Roman Empire and, and particularly the imperial cult because uh, uh, they were, Tiberius gave them relief, uh, money to rebuild the, uh, the city. Um, and they were very grateful. So, but what we see here uh, in verse 7, what uh, descriptions of Christ are mentioned in verse 7? I've got five of them listed. How many did you find? Uh, so the words of the Holy One, the True One. Yep, those he two. Who has the key of David? Who opens up? Yep. And who opens up? And no one will shut. Who shuts? And no one opens. Yeah, that's five. Yeah, so those five things. Uh, the Holy One, the True One. He's the one who has the key, the key of David, and he's the one who's, who opens and no one can shut, and he's the one who shuts and no one can open. Now, the next question is hardly fair. Uh, how do each bear on this message to the church? To answer that question, you have to know, uh, first of all, what some of them mean. Why would he... Why would he do that? So um, we can come back to that question. Probably the biggest question to answer, to, to look at uh, regarding uh, the descriptions of Christ are those last three. Uh, that he's the one who has the key of David. He opens and no one can shut. And he's the one who shuts and no one can open. What is he talking about there? Uh, let's tackle uh, each one by itself first. Um, first, what is meant by the key of David? Actually, we have we have um, an example that we can see in Isaiah chapter twenty-two. Um, and the verse I'm looking at, looking at is verse 22, but the context here is Hezekiah is the king, okay? And Shebna, you see his name in verse 15, Shebna is the steward over the household. The household here is the household of the king. So Shebna is the steward over Hezekiah, King Hezekiah's household. And um, Shebna turns out to be uh, an evil, a wicked, self-serving steward. Um, and, and so um, this oracle of God, uh, in this oracle of God, uh, God tells uh, Shebna, that he's going to remove him, and he's going to replace him with uh, Eliakim. You see that down in verse 20. And Eliakim uh, was, um, they think, an assistant of Shebna. And so notice, so that's the context, all right? And he says, uh, in that day, I will call my ser servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and will bind your sash on him and will commit your authority to his hand. 
So in other words, Eliakim is going to replace Shebna. Then, then he goes on, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Ju Judah, because he is the steward over the household of the king. Now get verse 22. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. So we see where, uh, where John got that. Uh, well, actually, Jesus. Jesus is the one speaking. John's the one writing. Um, but uh, it is an allusion back to this. So the key uh, back in in the Isaiah 22 passage um, represents the authority to make binding decisions in the interest of the king. It's it represents the king's authority. It gives him the authority to make decisions that are binding. He opens, no one shuts. He shuts, no one opens. Okay? So it's the authority to make binding decisions in the interests of the king. Now, um, uh, look at Jesus says he has the king of David. Now, the uh, reference to a key like that should also remind us of Matthew chapter 16. Remember after Peter's famous confession of Christ? Uh, Jesus asks them, who do people say that I am? And they say, you're Elijah, you're a prophet, so on and so forth. And, and he says, he says who, who, whom do you say that I am? And Peter jumped right out and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Um, and in verse 17, Jesus answered Peter uh, and answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Sounds like very similar language, doesn't it? Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Um, so um, what is this key that Christ gave Peter? Uh, keep your finger in the Gospels. Because I think, I think uh, we get a big clue from Luke chapter 11, verse 52. And, and Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, the teachers of Israel. And... Listen to this, um, verse 52. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You do not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. So I think what he's talking about here, you have taken away the key of knowledge, He's saying uh, knowledge, I think he's talking about knowledge of who Jesus is. Knowledge of Jesus as the Christ, because they were so against them. Their, uh, their teaching against Christ uh, 
uh, not only did they not enter, but they interfered with others entering because um, they use that, they use those scriptures evilly. They use the knowledge uh, evilly. They, they rejected Christ, taught against Christ, twisted the scriptures against Christ. And so because of their evil teaching, they hindered people from entering, from understanding Christ, who he is, and entering, okay? Now, God is sovereign even over that. Okay, the question here isn't the sovereignty of God, uh, but the question is, I mean, the, the issue is that um, the teaching of who Christ is was the key of knowledge here. And I think it's the same thing in Matthew 16. The keys of the kingdom is the gospel of the kingdom. It's the preaching of the gospel. That's what he gave. That's the keys that he gave. And he first gave it to Peter, but then he gave it to, then it was given to all the apostles, and it was given to the church, the preaching of the gospel. That was our benediction this morning. Uh, all authority over heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, to all the nations uh, and, and uh, baptize, uh, making disciples of them. That word disciple means learner, which means you have to proclaim the gospel. You have to proclaim Christ. And we're taking Christ to them to, uh, so that they become learners of Christ. Um, and we're to baptize them in, in his name and teach everything that he commanded us to do. That's our commission. So... Um, but I think that's what the key there is. The keys of the kingdom is the loosing and the binding, uh, the shutting and the opening, um, the way people enter the kingdom is through Christ. He is the way. Um, and so um, when, when um, we can see this, we can see that key exercised a few times. Remember when, what was his name? Uh, I don't know if it was Elinus or is or another dude um, in, in Acts uh, when he offered money mm. to Peter uh, uh, so that he could receive the ability to lay hands on people and they get the Holy Spirit and all them. He told him, you are in the gall of bitterness, you know, um, and uh, uh, told him uh, that he's not saved. So I think the opening and the shutting there, the loosing and the binding is saying what the gospel is and what the gospel is not. And it's not that the apostles got to decide what the gospel is. They were given the gospel, but in their gospel proclamation, they will be opening the door of the kingdom to some and shutting the door of the kingdom to others because of what the gospel is and what it does. And I think the opening and the shutting is analogous to the, the binding and the loosing. Okay, does that make sense? Um, Don't worry. Um, yes. In the um, Catholic Church, I think they, they say the Pope has the keys. Um, they say a lot of things. I know they do. <laughs> <laughs> but um, are they saying that they have, they're the ones that have the true teaching? Yes. Okay. Yes, they have the magisterium, the teaching ministry, which consists of the Pope and the art and, and the uh, cardinals and bishops. It's the teaching uh, um, function in the Catholic Church. They have the magisterium, so they are the ones that are authorized. 
to interpret scripture. I don't know what they've done with that particular teaching um, uh, since Vatican II, uh, since the Vatican II documents. Um, uh, because they certainly have Bible studies and, and, and all of that. And so I don't know how they've, I don't know what their stance is on that. Do you, do you remember? No, it seemed like from, you know, from the time that I was a girl in the sixties and up to the time that I left the Catholic church after I got saved, it seemed like there was more freedom for individuals to read the Bible yeah than there was in the earlier days right so maybe there were some changes made in regard to that in that yeah but it was in 1960 yes wasn't it? yes right but nonetheless uh the pope is still uh when he speaks when he says i am speaking ex cathedra cathedra mm -hmm. he's supposedly speaking infallibly okay and I, didn't, I didn't want to get you off on a rabbit trail, but no, no. And then they've got their tradition, their church tradition, which they set on equal footing authoritatively with scripture. Right. So even though they've loosened up and let uh, for the last 50 years or so, let laymen read and, and, and have Bible studies and, and all of that, uh, nonetheless, they retained their, uh, their claim to authority over the interpretation uh, of uh, scripture. And by the way, I think it's a good example of, I think that's a good modern example of Luke 11.52. The Jews in Jesus's day had the lawyers and the Pharisees uh, who would twist the scriptures, uh, who had the key to knowledge, the key of knowledge uh, um, and twisted this scriptures, misused that key and hindered people from entering. I think the same thing happens in the Catholic church. I don't hold the Catholic church as a, um, as a cult like Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses or something like that. I, uh, because they, they have, <coughs> correct teachings regarding Christ and a lot of things, but they, I hold them as an apostate church because they have lost the gospel for centuries, um, mm -hmm. uh, for millennia. And um, has it been a millennia? Well, for centuries, let me put it that way. I'll retreat. Um, and, uh, and so that's why I say I think they are an example. The Catholic uh, Church's teaching in, on, on salvation is an example of um, what Christ was accusing the lawyers of in Luke 11, 52. Mm. Okay. Thank you. I don't know how many people I just got myself in trouble with, but... Uh, <laughs> Now that I think about it, <laughs> I'm sorry. That was all recorded. <laughs> I know that's precisely what I'm referring to. Um, okay. I think we're going to have to close down there because it's three minutes till seven. It's a good place, it's a good uh, stopping point. Um, so this. This, um, just let me finish. Well, I guess we'll get that, get into that uh, in the next section, section three, what is meant by an open door. Okay, so we'll address that uh, uh, next week. So I think we're, we'll stop there. Ian, would you close us in prayer? Sure. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the day of your grace and getting to hear your word and spend time with your people. Thank you, Father, for your word and its ability to sanctify us. Thank you for your preserving power so that um, we would be able to 
persevere and continue to respond to it and continue to love the gospel. I pray, Father, that that would uh, be ignited in our hearts, that uh, Christ would be central um, to us this week, and that even the things we heard today would be um, continually thought over and meditated upon. Pray, Father, that we would also uh, speak forth the gospel this week and do what we can to be witnesses to a dying world. Yeah. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. Okay. I'll...